In the early morning of January 16th, 32 Al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorists attacked a major natural gas production facility in Algeria, North Africa. 800 workers were on site at the time. The terrorists, led by Algerian Mokhtar Belmokhtar, methodically went through the employees, separating the local Muslim workers from about 130 foreign nationals. The terrorists then threatened to kill the foreign workers if their demands were not met. They made over 30 phone calls with those political demands, including that Algeria's anti-terrorism forces withdraw and that the terrorists would receive safe passage to Mali. Mali, like other African countries, is being undermined by Islamic radicals. Instead, Algerian military forces attacked the gas plant, killing the terrorists, but 40 people from 10 different countries were also amongst the dead. It was a shocking, brazen, massive attack that naturally received global coverage, not just for its scale, but because of the number of countries whose citizens were affected. But it was important in Canada, too, because two of the terrorist ringleaders were Canadian, from London, Ontario. They were friends, Ali Medledge and Christos Katsarubis, a friend of Medledge who converted to Islam away from his own Greek, Greek Orthodox Christianity. The young men looked perfectly Canadian. They attended the London South Collegiate Institute. They were into hip-hop music. But they became increasingly radicalized while in London, Ontario. These young Canadians weren't just cannon fodder or junior followers. According to page 22 of the authoritative post-mortem of the attack, and I quote, a terrorist later identified as Canadian was particularly active in the Bas de Vie, one of the living areas of the gas plant in Algeria. How could that be? How could Canadians growing up in our liberal pluralistic society turn so extremist, not just adopting a fundamentalist view of Islam, but a militarized one, a jihadist philosophy that would lead them to travel across the world in order to kill. They were Canadians at a Canadian public school, not a Middle Eastern madrasa. They were immersed in our open, tolerant society, rock music, civil liberties, our popular culture of TV and movies. Who, born into that, would reject it so viciously and decide to commit their life and ultimately their own death to destroying the very culture and civilization into which they were born. For this attack at an Algerian gas plant was not about Algeria or about gas. It was an attack on the West in general. Islamic extremists divide the world into two parts. Dar al-Islam, literally the house of submission of Islam, and Dar al-Kharb, literally the house of war. And even though Algeria is a predominantly Muslim country, and most of the workers at the gas plant were Muslim, Algeria is not a Sharia law, Quranic dictatorship like Iran or Saudi Arabia are. That's why it's under attack by Al-Qaeda. For the same reason the Twin Towers in New York and the Pentagon were attacked on 9-11, because it has not yet submitted to a global Muslim theocracy that Osama bin Laden himself fought and died for. And the two young men from London, Ontario, died for two. These two Canadians were willing to kill and to die for that global Muslim theocracy. They just chose Algeria as their target. But they could easily have chosen a gas plant in Canada, or maybe a school, or a Jewish synagogue, or a skyscraper in our country, too. How big a problem is Canadian homegrown terrorism? The kind that was born here, the kind that would convert to it to become radicalized here, right under our noses. That troubling subject, a subject that most polite company desperately wants to avoid talking about, is the subject of tonight's special episode of The Source. Joining us now is David Harris, a director of Insignia Strategic Research. David, it's nice to have you here. You focus on international intelligence and terrorism. I think it was a shock to a lot of Canadians that one of the most enthusiastic leaders of this terrorist attack in Algeria this January was a Canadian. 
Yes, yes, and especially when you look at the horror that was involved in that January attack. You had these two individuals, Katsurubis and Milij, these two individuals, just an unbelievable situation, one of whom was described by a report that looked into the whole situation as, to say the least, a ringleader. They used the word a leader. And when you look at what amounted to the torture of those people who ultimately, uh, many of them perished, uh, it's just extraordinary to think of what a Canadian could be involved in. And he's not alone. We're starting to see what, to many abroad, begins to look like a pattern of Canadian involvement, inadvertently, of course, in international terrorism. It's incredible, and we'll, we'll talk more in the show about uh, Canadian involvement in, in other theaters of war, from Syria to Libya. But let's talk for a minute about this Algerian attack. It was so spectacular. 32 heavily armed terrorists breaking into a major compound with hundreds of workers. Very audacious, a very important strategic uh, asset for the, for the Algerian government. How on earth could some schoolboys, as they started out in London, Ontario, including one who was not Muslim. I mean, this Christos, as the name suggests, he was born in a, a Christian, a Greek Orthodox Christian. How could he have become Muslim and then radicalized and then wind up in Africa killing people? How did that happen? Well, uh, it's one of the things, of course, people are trying to look into. As we know, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service has been looking into this concept of radicalization. We certainly know that there is a small but not insignificant strain within Canadian and international Islam that uh, takes advantage of some of the more controversial, controversial passages in, say, the uh, Quran and uh, Hadiths, uh, some of the doctrine, to uh, provide justification for the most extreme of behavior. And that that seems to be at the heart of some of this, at least. Now, whether the internet played a part, of course, in radicalization, that's been notoriously a consideration. Whether there were people on the ground in the uh, locale, say London, Ontario, where we know there are real problems of radicalization, even involving some ostensibly respectable members of the uh, London, Ontario community, uh, is again a further issue. And how was the coordination achieved? How was it that those people found their ilk, whether here or abroad? And and then coordinated things to the extent of getting lethal training. And this is world-class lethal training, as you recognize. And then how were those forces brought together physically in the prelude to the actual attack? Mm -hmm. We know there was considerable sophistication uh, from a reconnaissance perspective in terms of some of the pillars of military operations, uh, massing of forces, concentration of forces, the discipline involved, and operational security. How was it that this attack and its planning didn't seem to have leaked out in a meaningful way in the period before the assault began, and therefore how was it that the element of surprise was maintained? Mm -hmm. There are a great number of mysteries here, and we'll have to look in our own backyard as well as internationally to find some of the answers. It's terrifying to me that the, like some of the ringleaders of this attack in Algeria came from Ontario. I mean, uh, we, we think of Middle East terrorism, we think of it in the Middle East. Yes, occasionally they come from the Middle East to here, but I don't think most Canadians think that we are in that petri dish. We are growing these radicals. Frankly, we're lucky that they decided to have their terrorist attack in another continent instead of doing it, God forbid, in London, Ontario. I think that, you know, that Algerian uh, natural gas plant, it had a security, it was in, uh, you know, a semi-police state. I mean, it was armed and protected, not enough. Mm -hmm. But London, Ontario is a city of shopping malls and universities, churches and synagogues. If, if some of the worst battlers, terrorists, came from London to Algeria, I could only imagine what they could do in our own country. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, terrorism internationally is the gift that really can keep on giving. And this is a great concern, including for any number of genuinely moderate Muslims who've been warning about the stage setting as they see it within some of our own communities. You'll remember that a moderate U.S. leader some years ago warned about how, in his view, 80% of U.S. mosques were dominated by those whom he described as radicals. Uh, he wasn't saying that, of course, 80% of U.S. 
Muslims are radical, but you have these elements of uh, Wahhabi uh, money from uh, the Gulf area and so on. And then a Muslim uh, imam from, uh, I think it was Italy, visited here a few years ago and said 80% was the figure. I've had a Canadian Muslim academic tell me, no, it's closer to 90% of uh, mosques here that have a radical taint about them. And, fine. you know, you see things in London, Ontario, of course, we have heard about the uh, chaplain, the Muslim chaplain uh, to the uh, London police uh, who uh, has been connected to a Gaddafi terrorist organization. Uh, this is extraordinary. What about organizations like the uh, Muslim Association of Canada, which is a leading educator of young Muslims? But it has previously had posted on its own internet site the fact that it follows the line of Hassan al-Banna and the Muslim Brotherhood, the very group that's been of such concern to reasonable Muslims in Egypt. You know, so many people are afraid to even talk about these things because they'll be deemed racist, Islamophobic, they'll be drummed out of polite company, even by other people who know it's a problem. No one wants to talk about it. I'm glad you are. Stay with us, David. There's so much more to come. News comes every month of a Canadian from Canada going to Syria or Libya or Egypt to participate in terrorism over there. We're not just a target of terror, we're a source for it. And some of those terrorists are targeting our own country. We're still talking with David Harris of Insignis Strategic Research. David, we forget that these terrorist attacks, uh, we, we know about the ones that were spectacularly committed, but many more are caught in the nick of time. Sometimes. By chance, I think of uh, Ahmed Rassam, who mm -hmm. tried to sneak across the border from B.C. to Washington to go down to LAX to blow up that airport. He was caught because he was nervous and sweaty and, and I think gave his Costco ID at the border. That's like right. almost by accident, he was caught. Thank God he was. He would have killed hundreds, perhaps. We forget about those cases. Tell me some of the cases that we caught in the nick of time. Well, and it's interesting. Even the cases we remember about, like that one that came to so much American notice and really hazarded our reputation, we've forgotten about a lot of the relevant details. For example, that Rassam was himself part of a significant world-class North African Islamic terrorist cell, one that led the leading um, French terrorist, counter-terrorist magistrate to describe, I think it was Quebec, possibly Montreal, as an international hub of North African Islamic terrorism. Oh. This was the Groupe Fatah Kamel, oh. and they were eventually, a number of them, taken off to France where they were prosecuted and convicted. And Fatah Kamel himself, the leader, found his way back here to Canada where he's now living comfortably. So this is the kind of thing we're looking at. As you've pointed out, you've got the Toronto 18 with some international ramifications. You had the Kawaja trial where there was an individual connecting and he was sitting in a perch as a consultant at the Department of Foreign Affairs at the time. And he was uh, collaborating with folk, uh, conspirators in the United Kingdom who were working in connection with people in Pakistan. So he was in the Canadian government? Well, he was a consultant, uh, essentially freelance, but That's crazy. he got in there. And in fact, I believe he was using some communication systems of the Canadian government in the course of these exchanges. So he was convicted. But, I mean, he'll be out in due course, as, of course, uh, Mr. Carter, young Mr. Yeah. Carter, will be. And there's another reflection of this kind of Canadian export, and that's the perception increasingly worldwide, of terrorism. And, uh, again, that won't do us any favor. Uh, Omar Carter, I'm familiar enough with that story. I wrote, I wrote a book uh, about Omar, but I, I studied his father, Ahmed, who was a terrorist fundraiser. He started off going mosque to mosque across Canada, collecting money for terrorists overseas. That's he it. was caught in Pakistan. They actually caught him. But Jean Chrétien pressed for his release only for him to go back. He died in a firefight with uh, Pakistani anti-terrorism cops. Same thing happened again with his son. I don't know why. Canada, you're right, Canada's getting a reputation, not just as a haven, mm -hmm. but we're actually advocating for, for Chrétien to tell the Pakistanis, let him go. Yeah, we know you caught him, let him go. I, I think it, it risks our reputation as a safe and gentle country. Well, another fact, too, relating to this, Mr. Kretschmann, of course, uh, did go. He did do this. And I gather he reported then personally to the wife of Mr. Cotter Sr. Mm. that he'd achieved all this. And you remember that the wife is considered almost as notorious as some of the rest of yeah. that family. And it certainly is radical. Oh, they call themselves the first family of al -Qaeda, Zainab and Maha Cotter. I mean, they are publicly rooting for Omar Cotter to go back to a life of terrorism. Now, I want to give Stephen Hopper credit for 
fighting hard in the courts to keep Omar Khadr out. But at the end, when the president of the United States says, take your terrorists back, I guess he felt diplomatically obliged to do it. That's right. And, and, the, and the Harper government has got to, got to squeeze down on the uh, immigration situation. The numbers are just not such as to enable us in a meaningful way to screen some of these folk. This is one thing contributing thing. We're bringing a quarter of a million people in each year, maybe 500,000 with temporary workers and students. If you can't screen meaningfully and in this world you can't really, you're asking for trouble. It's the biggest per capita intake of the G20. Now, when we look at other problems that we've created for ourselves. Look at the situation of some Somali Canadians. We have Somali Canadians to thank for the warnings we've been receiving for years about this kind of situation. And it is now believed that as much as the Americans have a serious problem with some young Somali Americans going to link up with Al-Shabaab, the group apparently responsible for the Nairobi Westgate Mal disaster, we now are finding, at least according to some of the calculations reliably put together, that we Canadians may be contributing in terms of proportion more Shabaab members, more people to the ranks of Al-Shabaab terrorists than even the Americans are. And they'll come back. Some of those will come back. There's one more thing I want to talk to you about. I, I mean, we haven't even talked about the Via Rail bombing plot. I mean, these things are happening all the time. Exactly. But I want to talk to you about something I find quite troubling. Uh, I mentioned before how people are shy to talk about this subject mm -hmm. for fear of being denounced as racist or intolerant. But there's something even worse than silence, and that is public support for these terrorists. I note when Omar Khadr had his hearing the other day in Edmonton to be released into a lower grade prison, that there were protesters in his favor. I mean, this is a man who has confessed and being convicted in this videotape of him building IED bombs. He's a murderer, a terrorist, uh, unrepentant. And yet there are Canadians cheering for him. This is as strange to me as if there were people outside Paul Bernardo's uh, prison chanting, we love you, Paul, you're welcome. I mean, we would find that morally repulsive and disgusting. But it's not just grassroots Canadians. It's the media. They've turned, not just accused, but convicted, confessed terrorists into folk heroes. How can our society fight back if our opinion leaders in the media have turned enemies into heroes? This is a grave problem and part of it is the failure of many news outlets to do the most basic homework. A great example in relation to young Mr. Carter. Just in recent years there was, uh, you might remember, a major news conference given out west featuring I think it was the then lawyer for Mr. Carter. It was Mr. Edney who was representing him. And uh, they had on stage all of these people, largely I think members of certain aspects or elements of the Canadian Islamic community. And these folk were advertised as the people who would help integrate, uh, assimilate further to Canadian values, Cotter, should he be released from the U.S. prison and he was then being held there. Well, the shocker was that those of us who were half aware of the constellation of interests within the Canadian Muslim community immediately recognized Mr. Zafar Bangash as one of those who was among this group who were going to help with integration. Now, as you know, Mr. Bangash, of course, is uh, the notorious notorious publisher of Crescent International newspaper, a radical Canadian Islamic newspaper that has had as its publishing line, its editorial line, that 9-11 was, quote, successful, that we need to see the spread of Iranian-type theocracy. Well, he's part of that Al-Quds Jew hate day in Toronto once a year, isn't and he? And the final line, I think this is close to an actual quotation, is that Canada is a fully paid-up member of the Anglo-Saxon mafia responsible for most of the genocides in the world. Yeah. Now, this if is that's an to de-radicalize or in deep trouble. And then there was a representative of the Canadian Arab Federation, which of course is a similarly un pro history. Pro and that's the thing. I mean, sometimes it's tough for a journalist to do yes. a critical job because they don't have the language facility. Yes. I love having Jonathan Alevi on our show because he speaks Arabic and Farsi so he can understand mm -hmm. when they're playing a dual game, saying one thing in Arabic and one thing in the English. Double discourse. But even, but even just typing a name in Google and doing I think there's they don't have the same skepticism. When journalists cover Muslim advocates, they put aside a skepticism they would have if it was a Christian priest or the Pope. They, I mean, they would scrutinize and check and challenge, but it's almost like, oh, 
He's Muslim if you even dare criticize you're a racist. Well, I think that may apply to a number of other uh, terrorist groups as well. That general political correctness, which of course is an insult in many ways to the groups that are ostensibly benefiting from it. But we saw in our national capital an example of this kind of thing. We had representatives of uh, the most senior elements of the police community in Ottawa, along with members of the Ottawa Police Services Board, a kind of supervisory interest, and I think that included some some uh, significant players in municipal government. They actually went in 2012 to, I think it was uh, an aid, uh, end of Ramadan type of celebration, fast breaking. And they went to a mosque that had on the very day that the police announced this visit, a poster remaining from a previous appearance by a fellow by the name of Imam Bilal Phillips. Now, this gentleman is notorious and for being deported and declared unwelcome by a number of uh, respectable oh, he's governments. He's off the hook extreme. He's full Sharia law, stone gaze. We, I mean, we've shown his comments on our show. He, he's, he is out there. That's it. Now, imagine the police then went to this mosque. It appears that some of the recruiting function of the police also accompanied these representatives. So police in Ottawa, a few of them at least, are beginning to ask the question, what are the infiltration possibilities if we're recruiting oh, yeah. from people who may go to such mosques? Absolutely. Well, and we're out of time, but let me close. I remember the, the quadruple honor killing of, of these girls, the Shafia family. One of them reached out, social services mm. and police, and who was sent but a specifically Muslim cop, which is a way of saying, shut up, you. You know, you know we're going to have a different standard. And, and she wound up being murdered. And Muslim, other Muslims have complained about this issue, too. Yeah, yes. you, Tarek Fada has exactly. said that Muslim police officers are specifically dispatched to him to shut him up as a troublemaker. David, we're out of time. Thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure, Ezra.